Today's sponsor is NetRef, a powerful internet management and ed tech reporting tool for schools. Stay tuned at the end of the show to learn more about NetRef. How to help kids ask more amazing questions now. Episode 459. The 10-Minute Teacher Podcast with Vicki Davis. Every weekday, you'll learn powerful, practical ways to be a more remarkable teacher today. Today, we're talking with Aaron Murphy about the right question technique. Now, we've had Aaron on before on episode 164 about leading project-based learning. She's co-author of Hacking Project-Based Learning, 10 Easy Steps to PBL. And now, Erin, you have a job since 2017. You are supervisor of humanities of your district in Pennsylvania. So, Erin, why did you become interested in the right question technique and how do you use it? So our district really became focused on creating student-centered classrooms under a previous superintendent. He really put in lots of initiatives that were focused on shifting the ownership of learning from the teacher to the student. And in our efforts to sort of find resources and strategies for our teachers to make that very doable, our curriculum supervisor at the time, Michelle James, stumbled upon this Right Question Institute. And the Right Question Institute is sort of this now brainchild that is behind a book that was written called Make Just One Change, which was written by Dan Rothstein and Luz Santana. And the premise of their book was this idea that people don't know how to ask good questions. And that's regardless of how old you are, they found in their research that people really struggled to ask good questions. And when you think about it, we don't necessarily explicitly teach the art of asking a question ever. So it makes perfect sense that people don't know how to ask good questions because if we've never really learned, then how would we know? Yeah. And with artificial intelligence, some folks say, you know, it's the questions that are going to give us great answers. But if we don't have great questions, then what are we going to get? So How have you applied this with your students? I think the biggest thing is when I'm working with kids and most recently in my roles, I work with teachers. And when people hear the word inquiry, there's this like major sense of anxiety about implementing inquiry because people don't recognize all the time that it really emerges on a continuum. And exploring inquiry doesn't mean necessarily that you're turning your whole class over to your students and they're going to completely take over and it's going to be all driven by their questions, especially not knowing whether or not they know how to ask these good questions. So that's where the question formulation technique really comes in. And it's a very simple premise. Essentially, you give the students a cue focus or something to generate questions. And an example that I'll give you, one of my favorite ones I ever used with a teacher was the cue focus was where you live affects how you live. So you pose that cue focus and then you allow kids to ask all the questions they want about that cue focus. And then you go through their protocol and you really fine tune and find your three priority questions. And then there's lots of things you can do with those priority questions. One, you can use those priority questions really just to create context for lessons you already intend to teach. So again, when you think about using inquiry on a continuum, it could just be you're going to go about, you know, teaching your lessons the way that you always have, but I'm going to use my student questions to provide context. So maybe they become an anchor chart in your classroom. Maybe they're headings in science notebooks or in your civics journal. So it could really be anything that then students use those questions to reflect on their new learning. Or then you could use the questions for exploration. So if you're a little bit farther on that continuum of implementing inquiry, you might use those questions for kids to explore something on their own when they finish their work. Or again, farther on the continuum, you could use their questions as the kickoff to a PBL or a problem-based unit. And their questions could really guide the entire unit. You know, when kids ask great questions, it changes the whole classroom. I had a conversation on artificial intelligence last week in one of my classes. It was actually with seventh graders and their questions were so incredible. It just blew my mind. What happens in a classroom when you start having students ask great 
questions? Well, honestly, I think the questions tell us a lot about what students need from us. So I think that sometimes we can make some assumptions about what kids need, but when they're asking really great, really high level questions, I think that that tells us, wow, I can change my instructional strategy. I can shift the way I'm going to approach these kids. I can turn more of this type of learning over to them. And it really helps you gauge their interests. So I think that questions are really a form of assessment. And when we hear those really good questions, it allows us to assess where we need to go next with our students. So how do teachers respond to this technique? How do they feel about the interactions with their students and how it impacts their classroom? Almost every teacher that I have done this with has had reservations when they've started. Like, I'm just, I still don't think that they're going to end up with the right question or they're going to still end up with a right there question that's not going to be worthy of high level exploration. And I would say that every single teacher has been pleasantly surprised. So how is there a mistake that people make when they're trying to implement their right question technique? Yes. Again, Dan Rothstein and Luz Santana, who wrote the book, Make Just One Change, they outline this actually in an entire chapter about what you should not do, essentially, as a teacher. They use uh, nicer words than that. But if I'm going to be blunt, then it's like what you should not do. And one of the biggest things is like you shouldn't jump in. So when kids are going through the protocol, it's very difficult for teachers to hear them saying things that maybe could be tweaked or a way that you think you could improve the question. So it's very challenging for you to not jump in and fix the question or massage it or finesse it in some way. Allow the protocol to do the work and let the kids come up with those questions on their own by giving each other the feedback that they need. How do you coach teachers to not jump in too soon? Because it is hard. Yeah, I really like co-teaching this experience. So I model that behavior when I'm co-teaching with a teacher. And then really, it's just a matter of teaching them other strategies. So whether you're walking around with a notebook and making notes for yourself of things that you want to go back and check, sometimes it's just a matter of getting the thought out of your head and jot it down in your notebook or jot it down in a post-it note. Sometimes that sort of takes care of that need to identify what you heard rather than just saying it to the student and jumping in. Would you talk to teachers for just a moment, Erin, and give them kind of a pep talk of encouragement if they're that person who's feeling anxious or like it can't work? What would you say? I guess what I would say is trust the system and trust yourself. So I think that there, again, is this sense of uneasiness when we're sort of turning over a chunk of instructional time to students. And I feel that we only have a few precious minutes with our kids. And if we allow this to go too far and I don't jump in or if I don't save this moment, then it's going to be wasted. But I think you need to trust your kids and trust that the protocol is going to work and that our kids are going to surprise us and our going to bring out really the best questions and the best ideas if they come from each other. And again, trust yourself that you've built the culture in your room where something like this will be successful. Okay. So let me ask you one more quick question. What if the culture in their room is not like something will be successful? How do they start changing the culture so that kids feel free to ask questions? relationships, relationships, relationships. (laughs) I think that everything that we do with people comes back to relationships. So kids need to feel like it's a safe place. And a safe place doesn't always mean that it's not a place that we're going to be challenged. You know, a safe place doesn't mean that we're not going to do hard work, but letting them know that, again, establishing procedures and routines and expectations that, you know, you're going to try something and it may be hard and I'm going to be here to support you and I'm going to love you through it. And creating those connections with kids is going to create the kind of place where they're willing to take the risk on something like this. So Remarkable Educators, this is a topic that's come up quite a few times in the last couple of seasons, the right question technique. I first heard about this at the National State Teachers of the Year conference uh, several years ago, and a lot of teachers who had won these awards were really raving about helping kids ask the right questions. So dig in. There's lots of resources out there. Learn how to do it. Thanks, Erin. Thank you. NetRef recently gave me a tour of their powerful product. Could you imagine knowing how much time each class and department spends on websites and apps? How about each teacher being able to control what websites students can and cannot use? As an IT director, putting website filtering in the hands of teachers while being able to hold everyone accountable is exciting. To learn more about NetRef, go to coolcatteacher.com forward slash NetRef helps. That's N-E-T-R-E-F 
H E L P S. Thank you for listening to the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast. You can download the show notes and see the archive at coolcatteacher.com forward slash podcast. Never stop learning.